Hey everyone, Julia Usher, Recipes for a Sweet Life. I'm back this week with a follow-on video to my recent sugar bowl video. This is the crown jewel of my tea set themed cookies, which began many months ago with a teacup and set of spoons. Yes, it's this lovely three-dimensional teapot. This is completely made with cookies and royal icing and nothing else. Maybe a little bit of fondant to glue things together here and there. I think you're going to enjoy it, so let's get started with the cookies needed for this project. It's a 16 cookie project, two four-inch domes, and I'll have all the exact dimensions in the video description, so if I misspeak here, always go to the video descriptions because it's most accurate. These form the body of the teapot. Then I have an embossed cookie lid, very similar to what I used on the sugar bowl project. This is about three and an eighth inch in diameter, also shaped to fit on top of the teapot. Then another embossed and contoured shaped cookie that's going to form part of the base. This is about two and seven eighths inch across, I believe, fitting on a three and a quarter to three and a half inch base. This time we'll be covering the seam between the two domes. There'll be a seam between them with the diamonds, just as we did in the sugar bowl, but I'll need eight instead of six as for the sugar bowl. These have been embossed and contoured with a special technique covered extensively in that video, so I won't repeat it here. And we need an additional three pieces, a molded handle for the side of the pot. This is between one and two inches tall, a very unique hollow cookie for the tea spout. I am going to spend quite a bit of time in this video about how to shape and decorate this because this is novel to this project, not done in the sugar bowl project. This is about one and a half to two inches tall. And then a teardrop shaped handle for the top as opposed to the plaque shaped handle we had on the sugar bowl. So again, I'm not going to go into great depth on how to shape all of these pieces because many were shaped and explained and decorated in great detail in the sugar bowl video. In fact, my teapot is styled almost identically to the sugar bowl because they're designed to be a set. So I'll be skipping through a lot of the detailed decorating very, very quickly, focusing in on the elements here that are very different those being the spout, as I mentioned, but also this base, which is shaped in a unique way, has much more elevation than the one on the sugar bowl and a couple of other added support features underneath. For the non-cookie elements of the project, you'll need several molds and forms to make all these fun shapes that go into this project. But the good news is I'm going to be taking you step by step through every element of the project. So even if you're a beginner, you could conceivably do this if you just followed the video from start to finish. For the first mold, for the body, you need a four inch cake mold. I'll have sources for everything in the video description. You'll need an assortment of round cutters of various shapes and sizes to cut out the pieces that will be draped over some of these round molds. And again, dimensions will be in the video description. For the handle, on the side of the teapot, I'm using the Wilton Baroque mold and just picking out this shape here. They have two mirror images, so you just need to decide which side you want your handle on and choose the appropriate orientation of the handle before you mold the dough. We'll be packing dough into these molds to create the shapes. Likewise, for the diamonds, which I show in great detail on the teapot, so we'll skip through that pretty quickly here, I use this first impressions mold and to pick up the shape here and then shape it over a silicone mold like this to give it its curve and dimension so it fits around the rounded sides of the teapot. For the base of the mold, I'm using another impression mat. Again, I'll have the source in the video description. We're going to be cutting. We're going to be laying the dough in here, pressing it in, then cutting it out with two different cutters and then shaping it over this form again to create the base for the teapot. I will show this process in depth because it is unique to this project. For the top part right here, using a sugar veil mat to pick up the texture here and then cutting with about a 3 and 1 8 inch cutter to isolate that shape and then shaping it, not over the small mold, but instead back over the four inch pan so that it fits nicely on top of the dipped dome when we're ready to assemble the project. For the handle on top, just a simple teardrop shape. I use this twice to cut a slightly smaller teardrop than this one actually appears itself, and I will show that in the next step. For shaping the spout, I have an interesting contraption. This is a Zacto knife. We'll be wrapping the dough around it and then plunging it into this cutter filled with tin foil so that it bakes upright in the oven without landing on its side. For additional embellishments, we need royal icing roses of two different sizes. I have a whole other video that talks about how to make these roses, so I refer you to that. We'll need 
a couple of elements to add texture to those roses, a little bit of cocoa powder to dust the insides and accentuate the petals, and a little bit of gold luster powder extended with alcohol to sponge the very edges of the petals just to give them a little bit of shimmer. Likewise, we'll need a different form of shimmer, this PME edible luster spray to fully coat some of the cookies that aren't gonna be iced, namely the big handle, the dome on top, and the little domed base that's gonna form the base of the teapot. And the last embellishment we need in addition to royal icing for piping are some pre-made royal icing transfers, simple dots. These are about a quarter of an inch in diameter. I use them for accents on the sides, at the base, and around the top of the lid. I've got green ones here, which I think I'll be using on the version today. I've used white ones here. Again, I've got a whole other video that talks about how to make those, so I refer you off to that. Now we're gonna move on to shaping some of the pieces. I'll remind you of some of the pieces that are very similar to the ones in the sugar bowl, and then spend more time on those that are unique. I'm working with my gingerbread cookie dough. It holds its shape very nicely, but any non-spreading dough would work well for this project. There are four pieces to this project, shapes, I should say, that I'm not gonna dwell on. We're gonna be cutting back to my previous work on the sugar bowl, where we did all of these same shapes, though, in slightly smaller versions. First, we'll start with a dome. This is four inches versus three inches for the sugar bowl. The key things with the domes are to make sure you are working on a well-floured surface so you can get the dough off the surface and over the cake pan over which we're shaping it, and also to use a cookie cutter that's bigger than the diameter of the pan so the dough comes nearly down to the bottom edge of the cake pan. Now onto the diamond. This is the exact same size as used on the sugar bowl. We just need eight of them instead of six. The diamonds, recall from the sugar bowl video, are molded into a first impressions mold, and when they're warm from the oven, they're shaped around the two hemispheres or around silicone molds to create this curvy shape that will conform exactly to the teapot. Next to the side handle, the teapot handle is also molded the same way as for the sugar bowl handles. Of course, we'll only need one handle for the teapot and a bigger one off of this mold. When it's all baked and cooled, you'll want to clean up the edge with the tip of a paring knife as shown here. And then lastly, the textured piece for the top of the teapot. Exact same process as with the sugar bowl, though just slightly bigger. So I want to capture the pattern on this part of the mat, so I'm going to lay my already rolled out dough there. I like to roll it flat to start because I get a better impression that way. Then I roll again just until I see the texture coming through the back side, and then gently peel away the mat. Do not pull on the dough. And again, make sure it's freely moving on your work surface because we need to lift this later. I'm cutting with about a three inch cutter, but I'll have the exact dimensions in the video description. And then the last step is to shape it over a four inch cake pan so it fits the top of my teapot. So now we're gonna talk in detail about the pieces that are unique to the teapot, namely this contoured lift that's gonna sit on this fluted round cookie. I'm not gonna talk about the fluted round, that's just a straight cut with an Atiko cutter, the dimensions of which will be in the video description. This is quite unique. I'm going to show you how I did the teardrop. It is a Franken cookie, meaning I've created a shape, a unique shape out of another shape. And then lastly, we'll talk about a nice little hollow spout, which is very, very unique. So to make this piece, I need to first get the texture in the cookie using this mat. Then I need to cut it with two cutters and then shape it over something else. We're going to be using a silicone mold for the shaping process. Now I'm going to start by rolling out the dough even before it goes on the mat. I find the thinner I roll it, the better the impression I get, so it's nice to give it a little head start. Once it's rolled maybe about an eighth of an inch thick, I will flip it onto the impression mat and roll it again, lightly flouring the back of the dough so the pin does not stick. And I like to roll it till you can almost see the impression through the back of the dough. That looks pretty good. We'll give it one more roll. And then I'm gonna trim off the excess just so it's a little bit easier to handle. Once that's done, invert it onto a well-floured work surface and carefully peel away the mat. You don't wanna tug on the dough or you'll distort it. You just wanna peel away the mat itself. Now the surface needs to be well floured because we need to lift and shape this again, but first let's cut it to size. I'm centering my cookie cutter over the impression here, and the cookie cutter dimension will be in the video description. But you want to center it carefully before you plunge. 
And with that done, we're ready to shape it over the black silicone form I spoke of earlier. To do that, gently press it against the sides. You don't want to press too hard or you'll press out the impression. Next step is to cut the little feet around the base. And for that, I'm going to use my oval cookie cutter turned sideways, cutting between each of the patterned areas all the way around. Then we slip it into the oven, bake its normal baking time. I do let it cool down completely or relatively completely on the mold so that it doesn't collapse. The next piece is the handle, which is a Franken cookie because I'm going to make a different shape out of a conventional shape by subtracting some dough. I'm starting with a two inch long teardrop cutter here. And I'm going to roll the dough relatively thin because I am going to ice the handle, I hope, from both sides and I don't want the handle to be too chunky. So just going to cut down first and I do want it shorter so I'm just shifting the cutter down and cutting off a little extra dough. I'm going to cut off about a quarter inch here just to size it more appropriately to my teapot. Remove the excess dough without touching the teardrop itself because we don't want to distort it. And then we're going to slip that in the oven and bake it its normal baking time. So now onto the teapot spout, which is the really curious and interesting piece here. You don't see too many tubular cookies, but this is what we're going to be creating. It just so happened that I have a Zacto knife that's about 3 8 inches across, and I thought that was the perfect dimension for this particular teapot, the scale at which it was coming together. So I'm going to be wrapping the dough around this, rolling it very thin, wrapping it around this, and then baking it upright in the oven. If you lay it on its side, it's likely to get smashed and flattened on one side. So I'm going to start by rolling the dough extra thin. I'm going to be dipping the spout so I don't want it to be super chunky. I'm rolling this maybe 1 16th of an inch thick and then cutting out a rough rectangle that we're going to drape around the handle of my Zacto knife and pinch it in the back. Now I've got a ton of extra dough there, which I don't need, so I'm going to cut that off. I've also got a lot of cracks here, but not to worry. I'm going to simply just roll this between the palms of my hands to roll out those cracks and also to smooth out that seam. This process will also keep the dough really tight against the handle, which is important so that it doesn't slide down during the baking process. The last step here is to cut the ends at angles to each other. So one will be pointing in one direction to fit nicely against the side of the teapot, and I'll be cutting the angle on the other end in exactly the opposite direction so it flares out at the top of the spout. The cuts don't have to be perfect right now because we will be filing them a bit later before we dip. So here's the basic shape. It's looking pretty good. Now to bake it, it's a challenging, more challenging thing, but not super challenging. You want to keep it upright. So fortunately this has a blade, which I'm just sticking into a mound of tin foil that's anchored in a conventional cookie cutter so it doesn't fall over or slide in the oven and that'll keep it upright. You might want to actually bake it at a slight angle. That slight angle inhibits it from sliding down the tube a little bit more. I would actually configure it like so, put my mat on the baking sheet so it doesn't slide around in getting to the oven and then place this on top and we're ready to bake normal baking time. When it comes out of the oven, as soon as you can pick this up, you use an oven mitt of course you just want to rotate this and make sure it's freely swiveling about the handle if you let it cool down completely on the handle it may stick on the handle then to set it aside to cool i stick it back in the foil and let it cool down completely or very close to completely i don't want to pull it off prematurely because it can collapse that's why i'm continuing to cool it on the handle so of the 16 cookies in this project five of them get iced in various ways. Two get traditionally outlined and flooded. This is the very bottom of the base. Likewise, the handle on top will also get outlined and flooded. I use brown here. You can use any colors you want. Um, I will say on these flat pieces, I first sprayed the edges with PME Gold Luster Spray so that from the sides they look sort of metallic or at least have some visual interest. I'm going to talk a little bit more about spraying particularly the embossed pieces, the diamonds, etc., in the next segment. So you'd want to spray these first, let the spray dry, and then outline and flood. Here's the spray I used. You could also use airbrush coloring, but this dries super fast. And now the domes get dipped. That's another way to cover curved surfaces 
quite evenly. Outlining and flooding is kind of impossible to control, so I just submerged these. And I did the exact same process in the sugar bowl video, so let's get a reminder of that. Now, even before dipping, we have to make sure the domes fit nicely together. When they're freshly baked and cooled down, they won't fit seamlessly together, and they need to in the end. So to do that, we start by filing. I'm using sanding paper here because I don't plan to eat the project, but if you do, Sanding paper is not food grade, so you want to use a microplane tool to file down those edges completely flat. Now we're ready to dip. I'm using icing of dipping consistency naturally. All the consistency adjustments can be found in a link in my video description. Plunging head on into the icing. The icing needs to be deep enough that the dome does not hit the bottom of the bowl. Otherwise, you'll get a big air bubble there. Gently roll it to the side and let the icing drain off, but before you set it aside to dry, quickly hit those air bubbles and pop them with your trussing needle. Then I set it up on a cylinder or something else to drain and then knock off the foot of icing again before the icing dries. Once it's completely dry, we're going to file again, again with a microplaner if you plan to eat the project or sanding paper. If you don't, you want to make sure both ice sides once dry also fit neatly together. Okay, so my spout has baked and cooled down. I'm ready to dip it. So essentially we're going to take it from undipped form here to dipped form here. And you'll notice the upper edge has been filed and gilded and also detailed, which come as, as later steps. But that's the end goal at this point. So my first step is to file these just a little bit more so they fit. They're just smoother to start and to choose a top versus a bottom. I think I, this is a cleaner edge. It's more uniform all the way around, so I'll probably use that for the exposed edge sitting up. The only other consideration is if the tube is fatter on one end, you might want the fatter one to be up against the teapot. So a couple different ways to do this. I'm going to file it a little bit more. If I can get this a little more uniform looking, this will then be the top. And to do that again, microplaner or sanding paper. The only thing you want to make sure you do here is that you sand at the same angle on both sides. So if this is angled this way, you want the angle to be oriented the same way. Otherwise your spout will look kind of rotated when you get it up on the pot, if that makes sense. The next step is to spritz the top with a little bit of PME Gold Luster Spray so that exposed end of the spout looks clean and we're ready to dip. I've loosened my icing a bit from the dome because I really want it to drain off and leave a very sheer coat. Again, I don't want my spout to look at all chubby. So I'm just going to add a little bit more water here and gently stir it in. The other thing to note is I've got my icing in a very deep cup now. I've got to submerge this entire spout. It's about two inches long, so I can't have a bowl that's very, very short. Now how do I get that in there without dropping the whole thing in and losing it? I've got this handy little foil catch that I'm going to use to submerge it with a little bit of a blob of foil at the end to make sure that the tube does not fall into the icing. And in it goes, head first, much like the other dipping technique. If it doesn't go in and is lifting up, just take a trussing needle, as I think I'm going to need to do, and gently push down on the top of the tube until it just meets the icing at the very top edge of the gold. And you want to rotate it all the way around to make sure the icing gets all the way up to the upper edge without going onto the gold at the very top. Be sure you look at it from all sides to make sure it's adequately covered before lifting it out. I've missed a spot, so in it goes again. We're going to get that back side. Of course, with any dipping process, you want to hit the bubbles before you take it out to dry. So I'm breaking those small bubbles with my trussing needle. And I'm going to let it drain for a while just by sticking a trussing needle into the bottom side through the foil and then putting the other end of the trussing needle into the styrofoam foam. I don't want the bottom of the spout to be touching the foam. I want the icing to be able to freely drain off. However, I don't want it to drain and stick to the foil. So before this completely dries, I'm going to break the icing here where it meets the foil. Otherwise, I won't be able to get the foil out later. So just clean up that bottom edge as you normally would, but take particular attention to breaking the icing at the foil line. So my spout has been drying for maybe 15, 20 minutes. Remember, the icing was very thin, so it drained off in a pretty thin layer and was able to dry pretty fast. It's not completely dry, however. I want to catch it before it completely sets because we need to get this foil out. If it 
sets completely, then the foil is going to be stuck inside, and that's something we don't want. But I don't want it so wet that when I try to get the foil out, I mess up the whole tube. Got a little dent on the bottom of the tube here, but we're going to be filing this bottom piece again once it's fully dry, so I'm not too worried about that. I just need to get the foil out. So I've lifted the whole thing up. I've unbound the foil at the bottom. It was kind of wadded up before during the dipping process to keep the tube from falling off. I'm going to try to keep it on the skewer and just press up with another skewer to remove the foil. And now hopefully I can pull all the foil out. Let's see. Again, not letting this rest on its side because it's not completely dry. Just gently pressing with this other needle. And I've got the foil out. And again, I roughed up the bottom a little bit here, but I'm hopeful that I can just file that when it's completely dry. For the remaining drying process, I'm just going to tilt it like so, so it's just leaning on one edge of it. And the bottom edge, the part that's least likely to show. Okay, so now that the tubes are dry, we want to file them up for a little bit better fit with the domes before we start any more detailed decorating. I've got one that I did earlier. You'll notice it's a lot lighter than the one I just dipped. The key thing is just to make sure that the tube color and the dome color match so that you've got a nice looking cohesive pot in the end. So for filing purposes, I just want to file it so it, it sits as flush as possible against the dome right about here. We're going to fine tune this more during the assembly process. I think I could do a little bit more filing and I do like to hold it with paper towel at this point so I don't leave fingerprints on it. You could again use your microplaner running it up and down until you get a nice fit or use sanding paper. And again, you want to make sure you're sanding at the same angle that the spout is on top so that the sort of the apex or point of the spout is in the same spot on both the top and the bottom. Otherwise, it's going to look like your spout is rotated once you get it on. So I think I need to take a little bit more off this side to ensure that. So I'm filing a little bit more heavily on the left side. And we'll just see. Now, it doesn't have to be perfect at this point because some icing glue will help to fill in gaps and we'll also have some flowers around it. So I'm just going to get off the really rough, jagged ed edges that were left from dipping and leave it at that. And now I just want to give you a word on how I got the detail on top. Ordinarily, I'd lay these dots on after I had sanded. I wouldn't have them down first, but this was done a little bit earlier. And so I just slip it back on a skewer on a clean styrofoam and piping with my loose beadwork consistency icing for dots as always. I put it on here so it stays steady without falling into the beads I'm piping. And I also have the ability to rotate it as I pipe so I can get access to all sides of it. Okay, so there are 11 remaining pieces in this project, the eight diamonds and the lid, the handle, and the base piece that don't get iced but need to be either sprayed with luster spray or sprayed and sponged or treated in some other way. As a reminder, these two ice cookies were also sprayed first with the luster spray. The spray was allowed to dry and then outlined and flooded with icing. But here, no icing is involved whatsoever. We're going to start first with a reminder of how the diamonds were done. Just as they were done on the sugar bowl, they were first sprayed and then sponge to capture some highlights on the top of the texture with a little bit of luster dust extended with alcohol. And the other three pieces were just straight up sprayed with PME luster spray. Again, it's very quick drying, though do cover your countertops and put up a backdrop, maybe even a hood because the spray does go everywhere. The first step in spraying is to give that can a good shake. I do like to elevate my larger pieces so I can get the can a little bit lower and around the sides of them, which is what I'm doing here. Now, onto the diamonds. Here it is just sprayed and dried, and we're ready to apply the luster powder, which you see in this little bowl here, all dried out. To it, I add a little bit of vodka, just a couple of drops to make a thick syrup. And then I'm going to sponge that on the very, very top with a small dauber tool. I'm 
touching the top very gently because I don't want that gold deep in the recesses. I want to create a slightly different type of sheen on top just by touching the very, very top. Now repeat that another seven times because we need eight diamonds for this project. While I'm here, I want to complete the lid just as I did for the sugar bowl project. This part has just been sprayed without any sponging, but I am going to attach some little royal icing transfers with a little bit of thick royal icing glue. Again, the link to my royal icing recipe with consistency adjustments is in the video description. So I just finished spraying the unique part to the teapot, which as a reminder is the base dome. And it's looking pretty good. The one thing to be mindful of is making sure you get underneath these little archways and that's part of the reason I have it elevated is it just lets me get in from the side a little bit better with the spray can. I'm going to go ahead and do a couple more for a couple of other teapots along the way and then we'll move on to the detailed assembly and decorating the sides of the dome. I'll be decorating my teapot the exact same way as my sugar bowl from a few weeks ago, so I'm going to refer back to that for the key steps. First you want to mark the half that's going to be your bottom and the half that's going to be your top, and also the front of each half, just to make sure it fits together most symmetrically. Once you've determined that, we're ready to glue it together. I'm using my thick royal icing glue with a color matching the color on the dome, so it's less likely to show. Now the seam's kind of open at this point, so I want to fill it some more with more thick icing and wipe it flat, and then set this all up in a cookie cutter so it's not going to move around when I get on to the detailed decorating. I like to decorate big to small, so I'm going to anchor the big pieces first, starting with the diamonds and then the roses. Again, this is my sugar bowl I'm working on, so you'll see six diamonds and six roses going down. The only difference with the teapot is I use eight of each. Periodically, you want to make sure to check that this line along the seam of decorations is going down nice and level because it's the evenness of this line that's going to determine the symmetry of the rest of the piece. That looks good, so I'm ready to put down the lid with a little more thick royal icing glue. I'm looking at that from the top to make sure it looks good side to side and also front to back. Now onto the smaller pieces, the green royal icing transfers. I'm anchoring one at the top of each diamond and another one will go on the bottom of of each diamond once we flip this over. That looks nice and even, so I'm ready to pipe. I'm just going to use a series of simple lines and dots because there's so much texture on this piece, I really wanted to keep the additional piping to a minimum. Here I'm using loose royal icing of beadwork consistency for the green dots and a thicker outlining consistency for the lines that are going down. I'm going to add a few more and then we'll flip it over and we'll be ready to decorate the bottom. If you need more details, again, refer back to my sugar bowl video because I go through this step by step there. It's the exact same process. Now this is turned over. You'll notice I've got the lid rested on the bubble wrap. So even if my icing on the top is still wet, I'm able to work on the bottom. Now on the bottom, I've done an even simpler pattern, a few little dots around the green transfers and then eight lines emanating from the center. Here I have six because again it's my sugar bowl, but on the teapot you want to do eight lines and a series of dots surrounding those lines. And that more or less completes the decoration. I'll show you my grand reveal later on in the video. Okay, so we're ready to put the base together, do some detailing on it and also on the handle on top of the teapot. Both of these pieces are unique to the teapot, so I do want to go into them in some detail. We did spray this piece before. Additionally, I reinforced it because it's not iced on the top. I wanted to make sure that it was sturdy enough to support the weight of the whole teapot, so I spread some brown, thick brown icing underneath and allowed that to completely dry. That just gives this piece a little more stability and it's going to be less prone to sinking or sagging with humidity. As an additional safeguard, I'm taking a little bit of brown fondant and I'm going to use that as a support or lift underneath this too so that if this cookie does get soft, it's not going to move very far because there's going to be fondant underneath it. To put that all in place, we need a little thick royal icing glue, my very thick consistency icing a little bit on the back of this, center that piece in the middle of the dome, and then you want to also make sure this icing is making contact with any icing up in the center. It's not as crucial to glue these parts down as long as they touch 
the base of the cookie underneath. So I'm not going to because it's just going to be more icing to clean up. Just make sure that's centered before you push it down gently. And then make sure all those little archways are making contact with the icing. My next step is then putting on, I like to work big to small, these elements here. And I'm just going to do a section of this. I'm not going to do the whole thing, just to give you an idea. These are nothing more than royal icing transfers. The key is to choose ones of like size. For this border, I don't want it too, too far in because remember, I've got to fit my dome on here. And if it's too close, it's not going to be making contact with enough cookie. So I found that bringing them out to about here and following this circular shape is about right. So for this, I'm going to glue with a thick ivory or gold colored icing. So if any squeezes out, it's going to be less likely to show behind the transfer, easier to clean up than the brown. And just pop those down. We're going to go all the way around in a circle with those. And again, you just go all the way around. I'm just going to show you how I did the dot work here. For that, I need a very loose icing for teeny tiny dots flowing rapidly off the spoon. So I will hardly have to push the icing out of this cone at all. There's a barely perceptible opening in it. OK, and then you want to go all the way around because now we're going to do some bigger white dots around the edge. And we want to slightly open up the tip for that, just a touch. Not much because this is a really drippy icing. I'm keeping the decorations to pretty simple lines and dots on this because there's so many textural elements on the sides of the cookie that I thought anything more ornate, scrolls or any other more elaborately piped stuff would really compete. Okay, and then you would just continue all the way around, but this is basically one completed segment. So we're going to keep this to simple line and dot work as well. This is the handle for the top. Now for the few lines I'm going to pipe here, I'm using an outlining consistency and a cream color. I like to start off the cookie so I don't get a big blob to start, but I just want to be sure while the icing is still wet to knock off those extra ends. I'm going to do a couple more graceful arcs along either side. Again, cleaning off the ends so it looks nice and neat. And now, I usually like to let that dry a little bit so that my dark green that I'm going to put next to it doesn't bleed into it. But we're going to move forward here on video time. Now I'm back to beadwork consistency icing because I want tiny dots up the center, something like that. And to finish it off, I want slightly bigger dots along the edges and at the top. So we're just going to open up the tip a little bit more. And of course, you could pipe in any different way on this. I kept it simple lines and dots again because there's a lot going on texturally, many pieces as well on the whole assembly. So sometimes the simpler the individual elements are, the better when it all comes together. Phew! That was a lot of piping and detail work, but it's all done and it's all dry. The only thing I haven't done on this pot as far as decorating the body is I've left a rose off here because I my handle's going to go here, and I think it's going to insert maybe more easily without the rose there, but maybe not. I can put it slightly off to the side as well. But I just didn't want to have that glued down and find I had to take it off later because it might disrupt something underneath. The other thing you'll notice is if you look down on my cutter, I've marked the front of my piece. There's always an area that's going to look most symmetric. This is a cookie, people. Nothing's perfect. And sometimes lines are going to look a little more wavy in one direction or another. So I always choose my best 
most even face forward and that's been marked here so I don't forget it. We're going to need to know that when we mount it onto the base here. I'm going to move this very gingerly off to the side and we're going to begin the mounting process in the next step. I've marked my front with blue here and I want to make sure when I plant this piece in the dead center here, it's not only centered side to side as I'm looking at it, but it's also centered back to front. So hopefully I'll get it planted in one step. If not, I can potentially lift it and replant it. But it's useful to also just lay a skewer or mark with tape the center on this side so that as you're placing it from the front, you're, you're pretty sure you're getting it close to that zone. Now it's really hard to attach an iced cookie to an uniced cookie without it eventually popping off. So I, I like to have a little nesting bed of fondant there to receive the dome. I don't need very much. And I'm using brown here so that it matches the bottom of the dome. So if any does peek out in the final construction, it's going to be less likely to show. Using thick royal icing glue, that might be too much. Let's take a little bit off. Now once you've got that fondant blob down, you need to add some more icing glue on top to secure it to the sphere, which is coming on over. And before you plunge that sphere into the fondant and icing, you want to make sure it's centered front to back and side to side. You really only have one opportunity to do this. You can lift it, but it makes kind of a mess, so it's best to plant it right the first time. Now it's going to be wobbly for a little while, so you want to prop it immediately. I'm using dredge containers, but any tall object will do. I am leaning them, however, against the cookie diamonds and not against roses or delicate piping that are more likely to break. Now if it's leaning at all at this point, the good news is you still have time to adjust as long as the fondant and icing are still wet. So you can fine tune it and make sure that it's standing exactly symmetrical and not leaning from all directions before you do your final propping. That's what I'm doing here. It looks good. So the props are going to go back and I'm going to set this aside to dry. So now the next step is to attach the handle. Generally, I like to work from top down on these side elements because if I work from the side and then work on something on the top, if that thing on the top should fall off, it might hit something that I just applied to the side and knock it off. So we'll uh, start this way, make sure that this handle's completely dry before we start adding stuff on the side. Now again, to anchor the handle on top, I'm going to use a little bit of fondant and I'm, I've changed to gold icing glue to match the gold piece on top. But I'm going to use a little bit of fondant too give something for that handle to nestle into. And I'm trying to push ever so gingerly here because my base is still not dry. And I've got a lot of fondant up here. You might not need that much, but I'm just trying to build it up a little bit to leave room for the rows at the base. And again, you want to make sure this gets centered in both directions. I'm looking this way as well as front to back. Now if your handle is leaning at this point as mine is, no worries. We're going to be tucking two roses around it, which will hopefully help keep it upright. I'm going to start with a bigger rose, about one half inch in diameter, just because it's nice and showy from the front, and using my same thick icing glue to keep it in place. Now it's still leaning, but by the time I get the second rose on, I think it'll be standing upright. I'm going to use a smaller rose for this, more like a quarter of an inch, because I don't want it to show from behind the rose in the front when viewing the teapot from the front. And yes, my handle looks great now. It's nice and upright. However, I'm going to give it some additional reinforcement in the form of leaves. They'll look pretty, but they'll also help keep it standing straight as the icing dries. I'm using a number 350 leaf tip for some big leaves to start. And when I'm done with that and they're dry, I'll come back in with a 349 leaf tip and cover that gold fondant blob that you see from the sides. But before I do that, I do want to put a rose down here along the seam to catch the handle. I didn't think I'd initially need it, but I think the handle's going to slide without it. So I'm going to stick it on here and let that dry and come put the handle on a bit later. Now to get that spout down, we want to test first for fit. Recall we did file it before, so it's fitting pretty well, except it's rocking back and forth a little bit on that cream outline on the side of the pot. So to make room for it, I'm going to score a little hole both at the top and bottom on the bottom side of the spout. And hopefully that'll allow it to fit around that line a bit better. And sure enough, it nestles down right against it and against the side of the pot. So I'm ready to glue it together with a little bit of thick royal icing glue. I'm using brown to match the brown of the spout and also the brown of the teapot. 
And because I filed that groove, I have very little gap between the teapot and the spout. The only area where I do is at the bottom near the rows. But I'm going to fill that in a sec with some leaves so I'm not too worried about it. I'm just going to prop it in the meantime while I work. I've got a 349 leaf tip here now filling around the spout, as mentioned before. I also want to put leaves on each of the roses that go around the perimeter of the teapot. Two at the top and two at the bottom. The motion here is pressing to create a bead and then gently releasing pressure and pulling back to come to a point. Now my icing might be a touch thick because I'm getting a rather ragged point to my leaf. If I were to thin my icing a bit, it would be a little bit pointier. But before I complete the rest of the roses, I think my rose that I put on the pot to catch the handle is now securely dried in place, so I'm ready to attach the handle. The only problem I have is a bead getting in the way at the, at the top of the handle at the bottom of the lid. So I'm gonna knock that bead off to create more room for the handle and attach with thick gold royal icing to better match the handle. And now with that bead removed and with that rose at the bottom dried in place to catch the handle, I think it's going to fit just perfectly. And it does. Okay, so I've got that rose in my handle exactly where I want it. The handle's nice straight up and down. It's also sitting flush against the teapot, so I don't see any air underneath it. But it is still a bit precarious because the icing underneath it isn't completely dry. So I'm going to give it about 30 minutes of drying time. Then I'm going to come back in with my 349 leaf tip and my light green royal icing and put leaves around it just as I did here. But I especially want to make sure to cover that fondant blob that's revealing on the front of the handle. Naturally, I also want to put leaves around all the other roses on the perimeter. Then it's going to get another long bout of drying about eight hours overnight. At that point, I'll feel completely comfortable removing all the props. Still, even so, once they're removed, be sure to slide this piece. Don't lift it up by the handles and spout. They're purely decorative. But it makes just a beautiful centerpiece on its own. You could, of course, also pair it with my sugar bowl project that I did in a previous video or my teacup and teaspoon video, which I did even before that. So if you haven't seen those videos, please jump on over to them. And in the meantime, live sweetly. Mm -hmm.